My name is Lori Costantina Brown. I'm president of Bridges of America, um, which is a faith-based organization um, and has been operating in uh, the state of Florida um, since 1976. So we've had a lot of time here uh, operating here. So like I said, it's my privilege to moderate this. So um, uh, with Mr. Jack Murphy, we'd like to start with you uh, making your introduction and having uh, your initial comments, and then we'll just go down down the road. Jack Murphy, 024627. I did 21 years in prison, and I was the first inmate to go for two years at the bridge in, uh, in Orlando. And I got him out of prison as a product of programs in prison. When Louis Wainwright was the Secretary of Corrections, he opened the door for not only faith-based programs, but college programs. And I got involved in them because this lady's father told me if I didn't get involved and some changes took place in my life, that I would die in prison. And I was thinking, wait a minute, my parole date's November 11, 2244. I might be able to do this. But I listened to her father, and I got involved in the programs and spent uh, 19 years in the Florida prison system, two years in New York prison systems. And when I came out, I reluctantly started going back in, doing programs. I worked at Sumter for 14 years as a volunteer in a uh, lifers program. I've been in over 2,500 prisons worldwide as the international director for both the Bill Glass Champions for Life program in Siberia, Africa, South America, all over. I go back in because this stuff works and nothing else works. Then I spent the morning in prison at DeSoto and this afternoon I'll be in Marion Correctional Institution in there to encourage the staff, to encourage the chaplains, and to encourage the inmates that if you want uh, uh, something that works, it's these programs that work. And I want to thank you for your concern being here uh, to, to, to learn more or to contribute to this because nothing else works. That the key to the whole thing, it, the programs, I taught school for 15 years in prison, all the different, uh, as a college uh, professor's assistant and all, but the key is your faith key, is the one that turns everything else on. So thank you for being here. God bless you. Hello, I'm Mark Reynolds. I'm with uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network, and I've been uh, with the network since uh, 1982. Uh, we provide four of our 20, 28 networks to correctional facilities totally free. We are just part of the puzzle uh, of the programs, but we are a, a big component, I think, because we are become a visually driven society Everything that we see, a lot of our youth are iPods, iPads, and TV. Anything that they can see coming from an electronic source is believed as, as being true. So we want to provide the truth through uh, faith-based uh, television programming. We have a juvenile network that we provide to faith-based or to correctional facilities across the United States. It's called JUICE. We have a, another Spanish network. These are all 24 hours. Obviously, the inmates are going to be watching these uh, programs 24 hours a day, but they are available. Uh, we have the Church Channel, uh, which is a, a very uh, broad spectrum of uh, Protestant and Catholic programming. And then our flagship network, TBN, which is uh, 41 years old. Our network, I'm glad to say, is totally in the black. Uh, we've been around for, we're, in, uh, we're the world's largest Christian Broadcasting Network. And um, we provide this as a service back to correctional facilities, tools to program directors, to chaplains, to wardens, uh, in assisting in the other programs and reinforcing uh, positive faith-based uh, programming. Um, we can be there when other volunteers, chaplains, or anyone else can't be there. Uh, depending upon the situation with the correctional facility. Sometimes uh, we, uh, when we come into these facilities, um, they are uh, either a faith-based uh, faith dorm, uh, a chapel. Uh, sometimes we're system-wide, like in Folsom Prison, we're in all the California DOC. We're actually in over 900 uh, correctional facilities across the United States and we do this totally free at a cost of over $2,500 per per facility 
Now, we can't wire the whole facility, but we actually provide this programming to the facilities as a tool. Now, uh, these, when we come in there, we, we provide, we come in by satellite, and we provide all the infrastructure is professionally uh, provided, installed, and if our system goes down, uh, either due to lightning strikes, weather, uh, power surges, whatever, we'll either repair it or replace it, the equipment that we've installed on our nickel. So if you think about it, if we're in 900 plus facilities times 2,500 bucks, you can see how much we're into this. Now this is, this is serious for us. We're, we blanket the world right now and we take this very serious that this is a, a part, we partnered with the uh, Florida DOC before I came on uh, to this position. I'm a second director, national director for TBN Second Chance. Before that, I was a television station manager for about four years. Before that, I was in broadcast for almost 35 years. So um, this is a real joy. Uh, if you would have asked me four years ago, I'd be working with prison facilities, I would have been saying, you're crazy. But uh, I'm not, and I'm, I'm so elated to see what's going on in the faith-based component. There's a lot of, of uh, really godly, righteous people that are in key positions right now that are really making a, a big change in society and in the uh, inmate society. And I think we've got a long ways to go, but I'm glad to be just one part, one initial, uh, what would you say, component, one spoke of the wheel uh, that makes the whole thing turn. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Jones. Um, I'm not on your list because I'm taking John Dybin's place. He, I'm from the Hanley Center. Um, John Dybin also had something come up, and he wasn't able to be with us today. So um, uh, the Hanley Center is an inpatient treatment facility for those who suffer from the disease of addiction. Um, and they, uh, our patients are very quickly immersed in the 12-step program, which is, if you know anything about the 12-step program, it's very spiritually based. Um, I've been at the Hanley Center for four years, a little over four years. Um, and uh, my background is I'm a lawyer, and then um, I went to seminary and was ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church actually came to the Hanley Center very tangentially. Um, one of my parishioners told me that uh, they had just lost a chaplain who had been relocated. And so I went there. It was, I was on sabbatical. I went there part-time on call and fell in love with this ministry. Uh, people who suffer from the disease of addiction get so disconnected from the people they love, from the life they care about, from themselves from God, if they believe in God, from, from everything. Um, and so it has been an amazing, wonderful ministry at the Hanley Center, and I'm happy to be here today. Hello, my name is Chris Sutherland. I work in the Office of Reentry for the Department of Corrections. Very honored to be asked to speak um, and be on this panel. Um, I, I think you probably heard our Deputy Secretary, if you were able to hear him, heard him speak, and you probably see why. We're blessed to have um, Christian leaders um, in our agency and leading our, and leading our department. And, um, if you were to ask me, 27 years ago when I first started with, the, with our agency, which I started right out of high school, working in the business office, saying I am not going to work for the Department of Corrections because my whole family worked for the Department of Corrections. I'm from Rayford, Florida, by the way. So there's nothing but prisons um, in Union County. Um, so I said, I am not going to stay here, but um, God had another plan for me. And um, w working and um, going to school, um, just wanted to be an accountant. Went, went, started being an accountant for the Department of uh, Financial Services, uh, working for the University of Florida. Decided I, I don't like math. Um, realized that's not for me. Again, God had a plan. Um, went back to work, work at the Reception Medical Center as a classification officer um, after I finished my degree. And... Um, Years later, sitting here today saying, telling you that I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary working in Tallahassee um, would be, it is a miracle. Um, when we think that we, we know, we think we have a plan, God says, 
oh, no, I have a plan. And when we listen to him, he reveals to, to us what that plan is. And um, so I'm, I'm just blessed to be here. I'm very excited about our agency. Um, I'm not just our agency. I'm very excited, like you said. I think our just society as a whole, 2015 is God's year. I just I feel up my spirit, and I feel like this is going to be a great year, us all working together to maximize the opportunity that we have out there together. So um, just thank you so much for, for allowing me to be here. Amen. Thank you for that inspiring word coming from the Department of Corrections. Amen. My name is uh, Minister George Ellis. I'm the president and founder of Miami's River of Life. We're a faith-based organization that uh, started in 1993 in uh, Miami, Florida. Our focus is youth, uh, especially the juvenile population. Uh, we also, in the past, have worked with the Department of Corrections in, in um, well, trans faith-based transitional programming uh, for substance abuse. We've done that. Um, my real life focus today is dealing with kids and coming out of the Department of Juvenile Justice Residential Program. We provide transitional living and we do respite care, which is for kids who are get arrested for domestic violence cases or situations like that. Uh, what we believe is creating hope for many through love and charity. I believe that many of the young people work with have broken spirits and the only thing that can heal a broken spirit is God. So we try to put them in an atmosphere of faith and love so that we can, they can be rejuvenated to, to live, think differently about life. You know, a lot of times when I first started in this, working in this, uh, in this ministry, I, was, I worked in the legislature. And I was working in the legislature, and I was blessed. I had a, a boss who was a Christian. The secretary was a faith-based Christian man. And they said, we're going to do the faith initiative in the Department of Juvenile Justice. That was 20-some years ago. And nobody wanted to really talk about faith base. You have faith base that existed in the Department of Corrections through their chaplaincy programs, but faith base, nobody really wanted to talk about it. And, I, and I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, the people on this panel. And someone said about how God has worked it out. Well, we got people in leadership positions who are people of faith. And at the end of the day, I think the only thing that could change a person is himself by connecting with his creator, they determine it's time for him to make a change. We programs just put people in an atmosphere where they can hear from God to make a difference. Um, I, I, I've worked with it young and old, and we could program them. You, know, you could program them, but when they step out of your door, what are they gonna be, what's gonna lead them? So I think that faith-based programming takes you to a higher power to lead you once you leave out the doors of our different organizations. So I'm thankful to be here today. Thank you. Oh, I want to say one last thing to you. Your father inspired me to have faith about what I do. I met him a while back with Barney Bishop, and he told me he was from High Lear from Miami. And he told me he was from High Lear and what, and he took me around your facilities and had a great conversation because at that particular time, I was about to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And he inspired me to, to do something. It's a pleasure to meet you here today, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our board's put together a couple of questions. So I'm going to start off with uh, the questions uh, here. And some of these are part of the specific ones. If you would use others, uh, we'll I'll put to the whole panel. And then I hope as we're going to this conversation, you may be thinking of some questions. Um, uh, Ms. Sutherland, the first question is uh, directed towards you. You know, nowadays, everything uh, that we're talking about has to do with evidence-based, uh, measurements and you know faith base is a little bit tougher to measure than maybe some of the other types of programs can you talk a little bit about what data you have seen collected or what the impacts have been um, and some of the challenges you know in continuing to justify these programs and I'm going to try to be careful of time because I know I can I can talk for a while if I uh, strongly believe in something and um, I, I, when I read this question, I said, you know, that's, that's tough because, number one, faith is such a controversial subject um, in, in, in this arena, or just in life. And um, when we looked at, uh, there's research out there, and depending upon how you, what you Google, you can pull up research to say that absolutely not. There's no, there's no, um, uh, matter of fact, the wording is there's no research, there's no strong reason to believe that faith-based prisons work. Um, then there's other research you can pull up. Um, can a faith-based prison reduce recidivism? And then there are studies that have been completed and done, and based on the, the specifications that was conducted in the study, then yes, there was some positive evidence to show that. I can tell you that um, for Florida, um, we do have the faith and character-based programs. Our first one was in 1999. We started at Tomoka Correctional Institution with part, in partnership with Kairos uh, Horizons. 
And, um, and since then we've grown to the 13 uh, facilities with dormitories and three um, institutions. Um, what we found is, as far as you heard Mr. Mr. Cannon say just a while ago, is we have found a reduction in, re a reduction in <coughs> disciplinary reports. Um, and to some, that might not mean a lot. Um, however, um, our goal as, as an agency is, is public safety as well as inmate and staff safety. Um, when we have fewer disciplinary reports that happen inside the compound, that creates um, a safer environment. It creates a more productive environment. Um, and like he said, that creates an environment where people are, they want to be part of something good. They want to, they want to be a part of something. Um, if you look at some of our other programming, the therapeutic community portion of it, whether, no matter what program you're talking about, people want to belong to something. Um, so even if initially they're not in there because of the faith component, the fact that they're in something, they're a part of something, um, that's what we're hoping initially might, they, might, they might get an attention to get in something um, based on the, the group itself, but then hopefully those fundamentals that they're taught, the role models that are being set by the volunteers, um, those other types of behaviors um, and that personal knowledge um, in their heart, the heart change will become as well. But as far as um, numbers, we had a PAGA come in and they did a study in 2011. Um, they did some research and they did find that at the, at the time, um, I think they reported that, that uh, we'll call a correctional institution, there was a 15% reduction, I believe, in recidivism um, based on um, that population versus based on another similar population, same type of uh, characteristics. Um, at that time, there wasn't anything conclusive with our dormitory programs. When that was going on, there was, at, there was no standardized curriculum, and like you said, with evidence-based programming, it's, it's, it's core programming, it's, it's standardization, um, it's evidence-based. So we've since then put some standards in place so that all of our, uh, uh, our faith-based programming um, is now has a standard core um, curriculum. We're in the process right now of, of going back through every single, uh, every single um, program right now to ensure that it's being not only are, do, are we handling the, the core components correctly, are we tracking like we should be, um, but since that was implemented in 2012 for maturity purposes, there's not a lot of, um, of real um, good data at this point because it is so new. We do show, like I said, of course, the, the disciplinary reports, um, we use a reduction versus what's, what's compared to the regular compound. Um, but there are some things that you just can't put a number to. I mean, I know, I know tracking is important and measures are important. But you know, sometimes if you're if you're in a situation and you you kind of get the you 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 just can feel whether you're in a it's kind of a tense situation or, or it's a tent it's kind of a tense crowd that you're talking to, like if nobody's smiling, okay. <laughs> or if you're in a crowd that you know you feel relaxed and it's kind of warming. You can't put a number to that, but you just know you have these feelings that you just know something works, um, and sometimes. When you walk on a compound, you, you know right away whether there's tension. You can kind of see how the inmates react to each other. You can see how the staff and the, and the inmates react to each other, um, communicate with each other, how the volunteers are treated when they come onto the compound. It's hard to put a number to some of those things like that. And sometimes, you know, I don't want to, sometimes I, sometimes I think we get too caught up in numbers and we try to put things in a box and we're trying to change our culture. And we, we know that we have men and women. We don't have numbers. We have men and women who are incarcerated with the Department of Corrections. Our culture is, and they're not just a number. That's what we're trying to make sure. No, that might, yeah, they have a DC number, but that is a man or a woman. That's a human being that we're trying to help change lives with. So I think instead of using numbers so much, I think we should go back and say, you know what, let's don't, let's don't put God in a box. So I think he wants to do a mighty thing. Um, as far as uh, Byron um, Johnson's work, um, and I think, um, I, think, I think maybe Mr. DeFore referred to him, I think his book in, uh, when he spoke the other day. Um, and he does, they've got some good research and some, some good numbers. Um, I do want to point out, um, in his research and, and with Texas and uh, Prison Fellowship Ministries, um, they did have a, it was a very positive result. That program was completely funded. And one thing with our faith and character programs, as you know, we're not funded right. for any of our programming. It's all volunteer run. It's all, thank, and thank the Lord for volunteers because they are awesome. And, and that's the only way that we can even do any, anything like this. Um, so anyway, I did want to point out that they had some great results with that. Um, and it was funded, it was funded by, the, by, by Prison Fellowship. Um, but the curriculum that we purchase, we do purchase it as a Department of Corrections because it is not a religious program. It is a standard curriculum, core curriculum that is taught. It's in the way that it's taught. Our volunteers come in and teach it. Um, and I just want to hit on that, just real briefly, you know, then I promise I'll hush. But um, our volunteers, um, the, the relationship that they have with our, with our inmates, is really truly how, how, that, how that creates that community and the reaction 
that the staff see how they communicate and that mentorship role, which is so huge, and I know we'll talk about that later on this morning, but um, I can't tell you enough that a lot of our su this success is because of our volunteers and, people, and our, the partnerships that we have, because without them, this program would not be successful. Um, the, um, she mentioned uh, Byron Johnson's book. For those that aren't familiar with it, it's called uh, More God, Less Crime. And if you haven't read it, please get a copy of it. It'd be very enlightening to you, um, the uh, impact that Faith Base has had on, on a lot of different aspects of um, engaging mm -hmm. with these populations. Um, Mr. Murphy, next question is for you. Um, we'd like you to kind of talk a little bit more about the personal uh, spiritual awakening and addressing cynics that kind of say, yeah, you know, inmates lose God as fast as they find him, you know, when they hit the gate. And, um, uh, you know, chain gang religion and uh, those kind of things. Can you talk a little of that? As um, Chris uh, Sutherland was t telling, it's so difficult to measure these things. Uh, Billy Graham has trouble measuring what happens at the Crusades also, but let me just uh, tap on that. In going into prisons and working with law enforcement uh, leaders in the correction systems around the world for the last 25 years, one of the things I always ask them is to, to measure, because it's so difficult, I said, I want you to go in your books because you have documented all of the disciplinary situations, all the contraband situations, all the fights, all the problems that you've had. And then after we bring this faith break program into your prison, we go out on the yard, we have uh, speakers and athletes and volunteers that come in. I want you to measure the same way for the six months after we're there. And I use that statistic time and time again to give them some, some uh, ballpark picture here, and I hear it all the time. They said, Murphy, we did that. We found out that there was an 80 percent, 60 percent, I mean never less than 30 or 40 percent reduction in disciplinary problems. And when you have to take those into an in-house court in prison, it's costing you money. And if it's a big system, if Mark and I get in a fight there and they just write it off, it's no big deal, it's still going to cost a couple thousand dollars to process that. But if he stabs me and he gets a couple years more time and I have to go to the hospital, it can be easily $100,000. And you can measure those things. These things do work. And, uh, and, and also in, in the measurement thing, and I'll, and I'll answer your question in a second, uh, going to uh, ACA conventions and putting a booth up like we have out here to uh, promote people for volunteers in the prisons. I worked with a man named Bill Glass for 42 years has been taking big prison crusades into the prisons and became very close with the, not only the wardens of prisons but the secretaries of corrections and many of those secretaries became involved with the Justice Department which monitors and measures just about everything that happens in prisons and everyone was reluctant to give faith programs any attention at all because oh that's sort of some goofy thing but when Larry Meacham and some of these other Christian secretaries of corrections went to work there they started measuring it and they and, and like Wheaton College measures the recidivism numbers and Northwestern and Moody and they say when we have over 50 percent recidivism a very conservative figure there all of those people say, if a person will get in a faith-based program and get hooked up when they come out with a faith-based program out there, it's 10% it's or less of those guys ever go back to prison. And when you do the math on that, and we're releasing a million inmates a year, how many from the division here, 30,000 a year? And in 30 days, 30% 30 of them are back in prison, and you can reverse those statistics that's a big bang for you for the taxpayer's buck right there. In my situation, though, I can relate to the world out there that doesn't care, who doesn't understand, because I was one of those convicts that didn't care. I had murder convictions. I had robbery convictions. The judge said he would see to it that I died in prison, and I didn't care. And I ended up on death row in 1971 because I was a ringleader in a prison riot. I didn't have the death sentence, but they isolated me back there at the very end of the line. And the Christians would come back and the officers would tell them, don't even bother with that fool down there. He'll disrespect you. And I was so, I was so worn out. I was so tired. I was so cynical that I did not think that this stuff worked. I didn't think that anything would work. I thought... 
once a con, always a con, and old dogs can't learn new tricks. I thought that was the, the, my story there. But let me tell you what, the only people who kept coming in were people who had a, had a leader named Jesus. They're the only ones who came in. Time and time again, you'd go to the AA programs, and it was Christians that came in. The program was started by Christians, but who knew that if you put Jesus or God up there on the sign outside, nobody would come. So you have to use a little finesse to get in to present faith issues and all. And then I started going into the schools, and I started teaching. And, and then this big crusade came in, and Roger Staubach from the Dallas Cowboys with a brand-new Super Bowl ring came in and played ball with us. And myself and a whole bunch of us went out. We would, you could be passing out pizza and parole at the chapel. We weren't going there. And there were no faith programs, really. But these guys came in, and we went out to the yard, and then he stood up, and these other athletes stood up and talked about the important role that God plays in a man's life. I'd never heard that. Somebody probably was saying it, but I did not have ears to hear that kind of stuff. But I listened to these people who came in from the outside who weren't getting a DOC paycheck. And uh, we had a, a chaplain, a marvelous, marvelous old country boy from South Carolina named Mighty Max Jones who led her father to the Lord. And I can't talk about him without crying because he came back there and he told me, when you get tired of being a tough guy, God has a better plan for your life. And he became closer to me than my father did. And in her home, Max Jones married my wife and I years and years later down the road. But it was the only people who held the fort, who had the same message, who had any concern or any hope, were the faith people. And I got to going down to the programs and never looked to get out of prison, but I started listening to the programs. I started listening to the programs and looking at the tapes and whatever, whatever they came in, and it became exciting. And today, I, I, I'm living a dream. A lot of people, they have dreams when they're kids to do things, go places, see things. Do, and, uh, but those men and women in prison, most of them are, their dreams have long been dumped. They're long over. But there's a dream keeper, and his name is Jesus. And if you get hooked up with him, however you can do it, whether it's Celebrate Recovery program, whether it's the television programs, the materials. But, and the great thing about it is, is Louis Wainwright was 25 years the director of corrections, the secretary of corrections. And he's the one who opened the door for the furlough programs and all these new programs to come in. And I, and, uh, and I count him as one of my dearest, dearest friends because he opened the door so that we could go in and do our thing there. And guys like Cleveland Bell, I'm sure you know Cleveland, that, and that, that ex-convicts could have a part in the solution once, once we'd got our mind right and had responded to the, to the, to the great opportunities. And Florida, in my estimation, leads the nation as far as, uh, when you have men like Tim Cannon, and Mike Cruz, who just left the secretary, as Christian leaders, it makes all the difference in the world. And one of the great, one of the great uh, examples that I use is we had a secretary named uh, Jim McDonough. And if you read his corrections, you would be overwhelmed. It would seem to it would take five or six people to have his military corrections as a leader, a heavyweight, tough guy leader. And he didn't play any games with anything. And I don't know that he was a man of faith, but he investigated the faith programs, our faith prisons and all. And he said, yeah, these things work. They make it a safer place. They make it an easier place. They save us a lot of money. They really work. And when a man like that endorses these programs that are coming in, that's a big flag to wave right there. And they do work. And I'll, I'll tell you, I can walk into prisons. I've been with the Kairos program since 1978. Uh, help put it in San Quentin where you're in there. Help bring promise keepers in there. And uh, I, I, that's what I do because it works. It really, really, really works. And um, uh, it, I tell you, like I tell somebody in the plane the other day, said, how you doing? I said, I'm living a dream. I'm living a dream because people like the P Department of Corrections open the doors for the faith community to come in. Not the school community, not the athletic teams to come in, not some, something else. This morning I was in prisons with my partner. This is Jessica uh, Santiago over here. Has a ministry called Passion for Prison. She's in prisons almost every week, all over the country, all over Florida. And we were at DeSoto this morning to put together a faith-based program. And uh, they, the ward says, "What do you want to do?" I said, "We do the big enchilada. We're bringing the motorcycles in, whatever we can do to bring the crowd out. We'll bring the sound systems in." 
in, the entertainers in. Well, he said, bring it on in. Because they know, today they know that these things work. And on the 31st of this month, we're taking about 80 women into Gadsden's Women's Prison up outside of Tallahassee. We have entertainers coming in. We're going to do a morning program after lunch and an evening program. Why? To change that entire the community there. And today, I have friends of mine that in 1973, when the Bill Glass ministry came in, I mean wardens and, 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 and the sergeants who were, became wardens and people who worked there and inmates, our lives are totally, totally changed. Not because we did a lot of time, but because the faith community was allowed to come in and present the truth that sets a person free. Did I answer anything? <laughs> People say all you've got is chain gang religion. I'm riding that all the way to the gates of glory. <laughs> yeah, well, so did a couple of thieves. The thief that was on the cross with Jesus, he had chain gang religion too, and uh, and that's okay. And that Bible that we bring in with our programs in that New Testament, two thirds of it was written by a convict in prison named Paul. Next case. <laughs> <laughs> I want the next question to kind of go to the providers and then corrections uh, to talk about some of the barriers or frustrations that they've had. We, we know that there's been some doors that have been open and there have been some we've had to try to kick open and some we've not even successfully gotten open. And let's have a, a, a you know, kind of a discussion in what your experiences have been in, you know, with uh, barriers frustrations or your ability to uh, really do what you want to do within your organizations and, and corrections. So we'll start here. Well, my experience is that uh, it's good. We spend all the money in the Department of Corrections providing the services to continue the services. So you don't have a, the, the, the transition part for the inmate is, is terrible. I mean, as far as the resources that are in the community, I mean, thinking about it, the majority of re, uh, inmates that have come back to the community, number one, job, one, number one thing they want to do is get a job to be able to provide for themselves. So they need some type of support once they come back to the community. And there's not a lot of resources there from the state level or any from my local, local communities for that. So, and I've saw, I've, 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 I, one of, a few years ago, um, the department, uh, DOC, invested in substance abuse, transitional living, faith-based. And that was a, a real good start because you had people that were coming out of the correctional system, out of, out of um, confinement, going back into community, and they had somewhere to go. Because I, you could be find Jesus, Muhammad, whoever you want to find in correction. If you don't have that support when you get back on the street, you're going back where you came from. You're going right back in that same drug hole. You're going right back in that same surrounding. And so I think that we have a greater a success as far as citizen if we can invest in that part of an inmate coming out. And I think there's a great difference between returning people returning to urban areas and people going to rural communities when it comes to resources. Uh, so I just think that that's something that providers, I think that's something that the, since we have so many state representatives here today, and, uh, and I know Bridges of America has been very good at advocating for what takes place within uh, as far as transition is concerned, and aftercare is concerned. But I think that that needs to be an increase in that. And I think the last thing I'm going to say is that I think that starts why they're incarcerated. I get a lot of calls from chaplains because um, I am a chaplain, certified chaplain. I go speak in a lot of prisons, you know, they get motivated, you know, and, and but when they, they want to know what can I get when I get out. And I, I mean, I can help you, you know, but, I could, but it's very limited, you know, even the resources in my community for them to go. So somehow I think that we, be, we need to advocate more as a body to try to get our legislators to see that they could save a lot of money if they start dealing with that back end when those people come, when, when those inmates come out. It would be supportive for what, for what is taking place with them. And, 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 and the last thing I'm going to say is that each community for us, you know, as far as I look at this, you know, the situation you're talking about us being providers, you know, we need to be um, work together more and resource. The example. Uh, I know you have, you, you're about the largest providers of aftercare in, that I know, private provider in the state of Florida. You have a facility that's in Pompano. Mm -hmm. I have a great facility, you know what I'm saying? But we got, we need something like that in Miami. You got more inmates coming back to Miami-Dade County now than any other, in, any other entity in the state of Florida. 
And there's, now Clee Bell has a program, but that's one program with very few beds. When you're talking about an increased number of people that are being released, re being released from the Department of Corrections. So last thing I'm going to say, that information that you have from your position need to be provided more to us so that we could be more prepared to try to find resources. Because with the way the economy has been over the last 10, 10 years, people <laughs> volunteerism, you, have to, you, need to, you need the faith that Brother Murphy has to be in the volunteerism state. People just don't have the resources to provide the way they used to provide. So you need some help in that area. So that's my point. Great. Would you want to take a stab at that question and talk about some barriers that you've had? Well, um, we don't, we've had we've had a lot of um, people who have been offered prison or treatment that we get, and we have a lot of people who've got a prison term after they get out, um, after they uh, get out of treatment. Um, but on a personal level, I have a church also, and one of my parishioners could not get a job because of his prison record. Could not get a job, and so um, we're. My church is very small, very poor, but we actually created a job for him. He's our sexton, which is a glorified name for janitor. And he does everything from electrical work to, you know, repairing the air conditioning uh, to mowing the grass. He does everything. So that when somebody calls, an a potential employer calls me and says, um, is he working now for you? I can say, absolutely. And he's also, you know, he, He's also attending his 12-step meetings. He's, you know, he's doing this, this, and this. We have all this evidence. <clears throat> many people, uh, I would say many pastors, don't understand that um, we can help. And, and, and there's woeful ignorance, I must say, too. Um, churches, I think, need to be um, educated as to um, where they have resources, where they have help where they can be taught, um, you know, they're just afraid. Oh well, my gosh, if I take on this ex-con, what's gonna happen to my youth program, for instance? In fact, a pastor, of my, a pastor friend of mine interviewed this guy, because he needed a, a sexton, and, and he said, I turned him down because we have so many children. And I said, yeah, we have so many children too, and he's, you know, he's uncle to about 10 of them. And they're climbing them all the time, uncle this, uncle that, you know. So we had kind of a unique opportunity to give him a chance. But what I see is that if we could train and educate different churches or other faith communities, um, you know, don't leave it just with Christianity, but the temples and the, you know, mosques and, and, and uh, all, all kinds of um, faith-based communities that this is a safe thing they can do and they're, they're really, it's very scripturally based, you know? Um, Matthew, you know, if you, if you did this to one of these, you did it for me. Um, so I think we just have to do some education. Now how do you feel the department can help with that? Or that the jails can help with that? I mean, you're talking about a barrier on, on the faith-based side. Yeah, I would okay? love to and, be and, able and, to. And the question we're, we're trying to address is what barriers have service organizations, you know, faith-based ministries are coming in, whether they're doing a, a weekend or a long-term, you know, what barriers have they faced uh, going into the institutions um, or into the jails and, um, you know, those kinds of challenges, because what we really want to do is have that dialogue of, of how to be better partners, um, both from the faith-based side and from the correctional side. So. First of all, Today is better than it's ever been. Even with the problems that we have, I think that today the doors are open because people are realizing, whether they're a faith person or not, they realize that this is a needed solution. And with budgets so drastically cut in law enforcement all across the country, they're looking for solutions. And uh, I, I, I can remember when, when the doors were slammed shut and, but very seldom do you find that. Do you call up and your church wants to go in? Uh, the Episcopal Church was involved with the Catholic Church, involved with Curcio, and, and uh, uh, the, the doors opened. And, but Florida has been one of the states that has shown them how to do this and opened the doors. We work in California prisons. 
you might as well go to the moon. I, I mean, the pro situations out there, but, but we have solutions that are working. And I think that, that the, when the Lord is involved in these things, you're not alone. And you see that happening. This morning at the meeting we had with the uh, officials and security team down there, it was comfortable. And I've been in those where they weren't comfortable, where they were they're difficult. But I think we're in better shape today. And it's exactly as you said, the public doesn't know. There needs some, to be some sort of education. And I'll tell you, what you're doing here is, is so needed. Yeah. That bless you for, for opening these doors so people can find out. People don't know. They just don't know. And like she said, the churches are afraid. The communities are afraid. The law enforcement people are up to here with problems. And uh, there needs to be a, a bigger education thing there. And I think the Department of Corrections could be someone with a much louder voice as to the uh, validity of these programs. And you're, you're right on target. Everyone is right on target. And one thing, we realize that too. One thing that um, a lot of unless you have a unless you're a small community and you have a prison in your backyard, you don't you don't yeah. really know what all goes on. You don't probably know that there's there's opportunities out there uh, to volunteer in a prison and what is needed, or the fact that hey, there's men and women coming back to that community every every year. Not one community is excluded. So why they should take a vested interest because everybody's returning. Mm -hmm. um, they're they are going back to their communities. But one thing that we are, um, are in the process of trying to um, establish and create and develop is a Changing Lives faith-based network. And what that, that, what, what that is is a way that the faith-based community can develop their own network. So like what you said, so there's a way there's to connect. I guess we're trying to connect the network to the network so that, that we have all of our faith-based faith providers, nonprofits, who, who, and they could go to, it doesn't, doesn't have to be just a faith base, like you said. It could be anybody. Mm -hmm. But somebody to go out there and, and knock on doors and, and, and go talk to churches and say, hey, this is what's needed. This is, you know, did you know this many people are coming back to this community? Um, or these are the needs. As a community, we need to surround these people and take them back in, mm -hmm. whether it's through housing, mm -hmm. whether it's through some type of assistance. Um, so there is a lack of education understanding. You're exactly right. And we, we do recognize that. And we do need to be a louder voice. Another thing, we're, we have community partnership events. And I'm not sure how advertised those are. We welcome anybody that wants to come to our community partnership events. We welcome that because that way you see exactly what's going on behind the fence. That is a way of saying, hey, we, we need volunteers here. Where we, this is where we need them at. This is another way that we've also found that we've had employers come in and say, you know what? Before today, coming into this prison, I would not have accepted an application from if, if they if they marked they had been in prison yeah. for they had been committed a felony. But right. today, he said, before I I'd automatically go and just trash those trash them, just shred them. Right. But now I'm willing to give them the opportunity because I see, hey, y'all do provide programming. There is a lot more going on than what I thought. So we we want to be transparent. We are trying to get away a, a avenue of of getting the faith-based network connected so we know what's out there and share of reach, uh, sharing of resources. One thing I do want to say too, to back to what you said earlier was. Um, we talk about reduction in contraband, I mean reduction in DRs, which is reduction in contraband, go back to the measurement part. Another thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention, is um, only a third of our inmates obviously go, go out on supervision. Um, whereas a lot of other states, there's, there's a majority of their inmates serve some type of parole or supervision. So there is a tracking mechanism to see exactly as a follow-up what's really going on are those aftercare services that's, that's provided. So I think that's one thing as Florida, one thing that we don't have compared to what the other states do have. And the other thing is um, over the years, our program, you know, as you know, our budget has been um, cut. And the first thing to cut is, is programming staff. And our chaplains have been cut. And um, if you ever worked at a prison, you know that chaplain is a, is a substantial part of that operation. Um, and when they don't have the resources that they need, but those chaplain's positions have been cut. And they're the go-to person when, when, matter of fact, we have a, a previous, uh, we have a chaplain. Actually, he just left us, matter of fact. Um, but uh, it was awesome. He's one of our regional chaplains, and he could be the first one to tell you when nobody knows what to do, they go to the chaplain. Um, but providing them then the resources and um, mm -hmm. but staffing to help these with these to actually have these established, not just these faith-based dormitories, but this faith-based community. There's a lot more we could do if we just had more resources to do it. Uh, let me just put it this: I was at a meeting with the wardens of San Quentin, and they brought in 60 pastors from that whole mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco Bay mm -hmm. Area. And the warden said, "Listen," he said, "we have an enormous." responsibility and we're releasing all these people and we cannot do it alone right, right. we need your help now that was coming from the department of corrections mm -hmm. to the community that we need your help and you're needed mm -hmm. and 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 what you're doing is mm -hmm. is highly useful and i think there could be a louder voice from the department of corrections to the faith community sure. to whether it's alcoholics anonymous or whether it's six, uh, celebrate recovery anyway i think that uh, the, one of the keys in leadership is to communicate with the people 
people there. And a lot of times there's a big silent void in that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, yes. And one of the barriers too is sometimes things differ, uh, differ between a private provider, mm -hmm. prison provider, and, and the state prisons. The state prison seems to you know, have a little more flexibility sometimes than going to a private prison. So I don't know, when you're talking about faith based, how it should work, it should be conformity of how that takes place, you know, because what the, what, the, what happens in that private prison as far as their faith based programming and what takes place in the state prison. Love Different, yeah. Well, we're, we're just, actually the the chaplain I said used to work for us, and he just right. went to work for a private um, a geo. Matter of fact, if you don't mind right. saying that, so we're going to be doing some collaborating and, and seeing exactly what the differences are, and see how we can collaborate and actually work more together on that. Um, how much of a barrier have you found uh, uh, in terms of getting ex offenders uh, back into the prisons or back into the jails? Has that been a barrier? And any of your organization? Parts of ministry? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a problem, and especially in the local jails, the county jails, in a way. I, I take uh, hundreds of ex-offenders back into prisons and jails every year, and they all have different rules. You know, three years or two years, and they have to be established and all. But 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 they work with you. You just. I think what it works is you have to develop some trust with the. When I call Mr. Cannon or or any, but it takes a while to get some trust there, but, but you can do that. It, it's not the problem people think. Our policy actually, our, our Department of Corrections policy just changed. It was three years, um, and now it's been reduced to one year. So wow. before, and that's, a, that's, a, and that's, that's a big, big that's a big difference. What is even, it now? It's one year. Wow. So they have, mm. yeah, so they can be out, um, and, and I will tell you, we've even had a case-by-case -case scenario based on the situation. Yes. I mean, if there's somebody we want to get in because it's going to be a benefit to for have, hear this person's yeah. testimony, we want them to come in. So it's, it is, it's a case-by-case -case mm. basis, but the policy mm -hmm. is that they have to be out one year, and then they can apply to come in. Um, yeah, an, in an interesting fact on the private prisons, mm -hmm. they're contracts are contingent on the success with recidivism mm -hmm. and w r success in re-entry programs mm -hmm. and the doors are open i work with cca across america we're going into gaps in private they say come on in do it do it because they know if the faith-based program can get in there and do it it'll help them with their with their success rates right yes i think sometimes the contract rules are a bit different mm -hmm. in what's yeah. allowed and what's not allowed um we get time for just a couple of quick questions so um, have anybody written them? <laughs> uh, the rule was you were supposed to write, but, but obviously that didn't happen. So, uh, I know you've had your hand up for quite a while. So. I wanted to address the barriers. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we have one women's faith-based prison now. The, and the results of the, the other good results of faith-based, so Bill Hillsborough had a 6.5% recidivism rate, so we know faith-based works. In a place. But Hernando is now that. Mm -hmm. We have worse conditions in Hernando than we have in general population now. The treatment of the volunteers were treated like inmates and worse sometimes. Uh, the inmates are treated as bad or worse than uh, general population. We're not allowed to mentor more than one inmate where we were allowed to before. We are not allowed, a uh, uh, volunteer was turned down to teach a Bible school class, a Bible class. Um, I could just go on and on with the barriers that we're facing at Hernando, which is supposed to be a faith based. And I have a letter from an inmate who asked to go back from Hernando back to Homestead because Homestead was better than Hernando. Many are being transferred out of Hernando back to their general population because it's awful. And the words getting around in the prisons, I talk to ladies in various places, don't go to Hernando because it's bad. So I'm just saying you've got a faith based program institution there that's getting a bad reputation in the state. So that's a big barrier <clears throat> to us as volunteers and to the inmates, the way they're being treated there. So I just want to make you aware of that, that there are some barriers there. And we had a, I had a friend up in Ocala who had some friends, at the, we were going to Ocala to, to a mentor up there, and uh, she had some friends in the villages who lived closer, and so she said from their church, go over there and uh, you know, become mentors and volunteers because they need people closer. They went over there and because of the way they were treated so rudely and so uh, inappropriately, they just left and said, we don't want to volunteer here. So there, it's the, there's administration problems in some of the prisons of the way they're treating the volunteers when they come. They don't want any part of it. 
Well, my, my advice. They heard you, you next door. <laughs> well, my, my advice to you in those kind of situations is sometimes there's a real disconnect from upper management to institution. Yeah. And when you're not able to resolve it, by all means, the first level should be to try to resolve those issues at the institutional level. But when you can't, here's your gal. Yeah, I'm um, saying, that, is, that is not you know. acceptable. It is not OK anymore. The way we treat our volunteers is, is a priority in our agency. And I'll tell you, um, if, and I don't know if you have, so I'll just, just but any time there's a problem, hopefully you work, your administration, obviously, your, your warden, if, if that's some of the problem, that regional director, um, if you can't, if there's nothing that, the regional director, then, and I'll means anybody's welcome to call me at any time, but that is, not, that is not acceptable. And one thing that we are working with doing is working with Volunteer Florida to come up to develop a volunteer survey that we send out to all of our volunteers because I know sometimes we thought, well, if, if, let's, don't get, let's don't do it at the institutional level because there's, it's going to be anonymous, so there, there's no way that it can be messed with. Or we want people's true, we want people's um, true um, experiences, and we want to know is the, what are what are the barriers? Do you have barriers here? How are you being treated? How long have you had to wait at the gate? Um, how long you have to wait to the inmates to get to you, um, so that we can see? Okay, what are our what are our best facilities and publish that information? That, hey, these are our top ten volunteer friendly institutions. Versus, and if we have a problem at some of them, then we need to find out why. But um, that, no, those kind of, that, that is not acceptable. Um, and, I, and I promise you, if we know that that's happening, um, we're doing something about it. It's, it's, it's interesting that the wardens there, because we worked there at that prison, they inherited this faith-based thing. It wasn't a faith-based prison. And sometimes they have to adjust to that transition, because it's a different mindset to run a faith-based prison. They, and it's they, changing. They need to be trained. The administration there needs to be trained. And all the officers there need to be trained. On you need to pray for them. Yeah. <laughs>